What's up, my dogs? It's Joe and Tom, Truffle Mockery. We're back with a new podcast and a special guest this time. But before we get into that, Joe, give me some highs and lows, mate. I've got a low, mate. And uh, my low is your playlist. Suffering through uh, a bike ride, listening to a co- Atomic Kitten, Ronan Keaton, Tarzan. And Celine Lord Dion. Them. Celine Dion, yeah. Hakuna Matata. Yeah. That's you know, you're the week, first mate. person I've week. ever met, because I meet a lot of people, that says a shit playlist. Do you know how many people told me online, mate, can I have that training playlist? It's absolutely but banging you, tunes. You know at the track, when we were doing the session on Saturday? Yeah. The uh, the, 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 the other triathletes commented on it and said, on our one and said that they liked the playlist. I told you. Play- no, I'll play- my playlist. Yours? Yeah, they said they, want- they said they wanted it and that they're going to get their coach to do it. Oh, that was a bit that was the, yeah, that But was- I, would, I don't know. <laughs> to me, uh, any- I, I, I don't know anyone who wouldn't be able to do a long endurance ride to Celine Dion. It brings terrible. off Titanic memories. You think it's terrible? Absolutely. Horrific. That's your low? That's my low, yeah. And you've only got two more weeks to listen to it. I'd have to take headphones or something because that was like literally and then the, an even bigger low was the fact that you thought Ronan Keaton was better than Ed Sheeran but that's like I could spend a whole hour going on about that <laughs> so Joe and I Joe and I had a discussion and I say picture this you're at a concert you could either go to concert A with Drake Ed Sheeran and Jay-Z or you could go to another concert with Celine Dion Ronan Keaton um who else was there? Who, was it? Who else was one of them? Oh, Enrique Tarzan. Iglesias. Enrique Iglesias, Tarzan. Mate, I can tell you that. It's all classics. People will go absolutely think, nuts. It will be love all around. Yeah, Ed Sheeran is overrated. Nah, mate. He's not bigger than Ronan Keating. He's definitely bigger than Ronan Keating. <laughs> this is, this so is if what... you don't know who Ronan Keating is, just <laughs> then, put on... Then that just proves my point. <laughs> <laughs> it, made me, it made me bruise this point, but then if you hear the music... <laughs> When you say nothing at all, just think of all That's everything. That's like the only good one he's got. Just, just think about everything you've accomplished in triathlon, all the hard work you put into it. Think about your loved ones, and you'll start bursting in tears. And you, and it's just all the laugh, mate. I, I've never had that with Ed Sheeran. Never had that with Ed Sheeran. He yeah. just doesn't hit like that. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, that, that is your low. That that was my low. Yeah. Oh, it sounds like a high to me. <laughs> um. I must say, training has been going really well. I, I don't really have a real low, to be honest. I know like, your high must have been having a rest day today and putting your feet up. Right? Yeah, it does. It, it does. I, I've been training hard for two weeks. Today I had one easy day and tomorrow I'll be uh, back after it. But a high of us must be we took the calm. So the last podcast, we say we, want to get, we were going to take the, the calm of the other games. Oh, I forgot about that, yeah. How can you forget? I forgot. That would have been on my highs as well, but I yeah. completely forgot. So we got the KOM um, basically in a two-up during And me. we said we were going to do it, and we put it out put it out on the podcast, didn't we, before we did it. So the yeah. pressure was on, wasn't it? We did it by like two k's an hour. And we weren't even like, we did one practice lap, and it didn't even go that well, did it? Uh, it, it went all right. Like uh, I, th- I thought it wasn't too bad. Like I no, knew, so too, so too. I knew from the practice lap that we were going to get the com. After that, I was pretty confident. But I've also seen that we've got another target as well next time. Remy Cavagna, yeah. you found on it. I found an hour segment, forty-seven k's an hour for Luke. Same Luke. Same Luke, but just a slight de- deviation, isn't it? Slight deviation, different yeah. start point. Do you think we got the minerals for it? I think that's a that's a t- that's a tough one. If I'm honest, like that's going to take a bit of work, a bit of practice. It's going to be. We ain't going to. We're in our third week right now. This is going to be a third week at altitude camp. We're a bit more adapted to like the altitude. We've got a little bit more red blood cells. What do you reckon? Get fit or get fucked. <laughs> 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 well, let's go. Um, that's a valid point. Yeah. So um, yeah, we'll be. Uh, I'll be back after it tomorrow. Only highs, mate. Like literally, I think training in front remote is so good. We've been uh, high was. Um, have taken Christian Blumenfeld again out for a pizza. Yeah, next time he'll be on the beers, won't he? Before long, actually, he's he's gone now, isn't he? He's I'm like a I'm like a sugar daddy, ain't I? You're like a sugar daddy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he'll probably be taking you on tour with him next. <laughs> no, anyway, um, let's get over uh, this week to uh, the main subject of the week. Let's, like we said last week, we've got uh, Thomas Decker on the show. Joe, give him a little introduction. So, we've, yeah, we've got Thomas Decker. Thomas Decker was a Dutch former professional road racing cyclist. His career highlights included winning Torino Adriatico in 2006 and the Tour de Romandie in 2007. He won two Dutch national time trial championships. So if he was, if he was in an Ironman, you'd be fucked. Uh, he represented his country at the 2004 Summer Olympics held in Athens, Greece. But later on in his career, Thomas was banned from professional cycling the day before the 2009 Tour de France from a retroactive test from 2007. He was banned for two years, but later made a comeback in 2011 for the Garmin Slipstream cycling team. 
So today we're here with Thomas and... Uh... First of all, you might be wondering, like, why is he on a trial of mockery training camp? Uh, so last year I did this migration gravel race where I was practicing the altitude already for this fun remote camp. Um, that's where I met Thomas and, um, well, 15 years after uh, his uh, his career. He's a changed man now. <laughs> he's, uh, he's got a colorful life. Uh, he's done everything you can uh, probably think of. If you've read his book, you know all about it. Um, and um, that made him uh, the, the person he is uh, today. And he's got some awesome stories. In. But one thing I find interesting is the psychological effect about it. Um, doping and triathlon, doping in, like, in general. Um, what do you think about it nowadays? But before we get to that, rate this uh, podcast room because you're normally always in uh, reality TV series. You're in like bit podcast recording rooms. And right now you're sitting in my uh, dusty bedroom. Me, Joe, very close to the microphone. If you're watching it on YouTube, you can see it. We're almost kissing each other, holding hands. Yeah, this is, to be honest, to be my first podcast on altitude. So normally I always do the podcast recording at sea level. <laughs> um, but the nice thing about podcasts is that uh, everyone can start one. And uh, it's really interesting if you like the subject and you guys started this. And uh, you don't need a studio to have uh, have some fun and to create some uh, some good stories. No, that's... Uh, that's so uh, go on, guys. So reading in your uh, book, like, because I've, I've been... Uh, trying to brush up on my knowledge of you yeah. and uh, seeing what like, what your background was like, from how you grew up and stuff. It seems like you grew up from a very well-rounded family. Like your your background when you were a kid was uh, really normal, wasn't yeah. it? You know, and before, when you, when I, in my head, I always have these like preconceptions of someone that was caught dope and, you know, come from like a dodgy family or like, you know, had a rough childhood, but yours was totally normal, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, like, absolutely. What, what was... Uh, what was your childhood like what, in your life? So I think with every sport, uh, it's really important um, to have like supportive parents. And um, so uh, I came to this altitude camp uh, to join you guys and you saw your father. He was also here for the first 10 days. And it's nice that you have somebody who drives the car and is supportive. And uh, even uh, it's more important at a young age. So uh, with cycling, you have to travel a lot. And uh, my father was always uh, bringing me to all the races. And um, yeah, a pretty normal childhood. Only uh, he, uh, my father, had a son who was so ambitious uh, that he um, trained trained a lot at a young age. And later on, he made some wrong decisions. So I don't think the background is so important. I think um, if you're willing to sacrifice everything, and that I did, uh, it also um, had a huge effect on my family. And so uh, I'm happy that I had the, the good values of my family, but it was not. Um, not because of them. It was because of my extreme uh, uh, hunger to success. And you think that extreme hunger to success, what made it at one point uh, that you're at a certain age made the change? What was the... So to be honest, like uh, probably most people don't know, but my career started at 16 years. Uh, when I was 16 years old, I signed my first contract with Rabobank. That's the biggest bank in Holland. And uh, they had the biggest cycling team. So uh, I did the juniors and then I did the under 23 category. And when the, at the juniors, I was the number one in the world. And the under 23, I was the number one in the world. And then I turned pro. And when I turned pro... Um, at every, a very young age, right? Yeah, 19, 19 which years was, old. Back in the days, was not very common, was no, it? No, now you see all those young kids uh, like uh, winning the Tour de France, like uh, Egan Bernal for Ineos, um, Pogacar. And uh, at the time, uh, you turned pro a little later, but I was young and I was winning a lot. Going and, though back to when you were uh, when before you turned pro, you were yeah. very disappointed, weren't you, at the uh, junior world champs? Because I like you'd been killing it, weren't you? When yeah. you, earlier when you were a junior, and uh, you kind of like threw your uh, threw your toys out of uh, yeah. your pram, didn't you? Like uh, after that, because you thought that that had that had your name on it, didn't it? You know, like. I think your confidence was sky high, wasn't it? You'd been winning all the races and then you went to that. Was that the first kind of like low that you had had up, you know, in your early days? Like, because everything had been going so well to then and you kind of thought that you deserved it, didn't you? You thought you were better than everyone and that that race, you thought so you should have been world champion. for the world championship, I did that year, I did 11 time trials and I won 10. And then at the world championship, I didn't win uh, because I crashed uh, a week before and I broke uh, like seven teeth um so yeah so i had like a huge crash and i know that i continued the ride i i'm uh, i had five hours on the program and i crashed yeah. after one and a half hour and i finished it five hours oh, no, with no teeth in my hand uh, in, my, in my mouth yeah so it, it was it was like saying a lot about me in that period because i wanted to sacrifice everything just to have success yeah 
And I think a lot of people would say, like, because you've, uh, like, when you see someone that's been caught doping, you always think, oh, they did it their whole career. But, yeah. like, when you first turned pro, you went on training camp after training camp and you were training 35 to 40 hours a week. Yeah. Um, and that was all uh, totally clean because it's, like, it's and that's pretty normal in triathlon, but in cycling to uh, just to do one sport and you do like thirty five hours a week that's when a you're lot. nineteen is a lot. Even in triathlon, that's a lot. But then, uh, as well as like with the recovery, I mean, like if you were doing that in triathlon, your recovery would have to be tip top. But yeah. uh, your recovery sessions were a bit different, weren't they? The normal. Tell us a bit about your recovery on a training camp and about the like you know your first experience as a training camp in the pros because it was yeah. a lot different than so the it, amateurs. It's, wasn't a, it's it? a little weird, you know. You're junior and you're amateur. Um, and you do all those big races with uh, with uh, the guys of your age, and then you turn pro. And uh, when you're a junior or an amateur, everything is really serious. You know, you yeah. don't have a car, you go to bed early, uh, there is always somebody watching you, and then you turn pro. And all those pros, um, they all winter, they're at home with their wife, they're, unha they're not happy, um, they don't know their own ch ch children really well, and then but, the first training camp comes. You, know, you go going, to Spain. Going back to that though, what you said about the what the the uh, tri the uh, cyclists not being happy because they're at home with their wives. There is a triathlete that we know who's quite a big name. Yeah, and he says that he can tell depend on whether or not he's trained enough because if his sex drive goes down mm -hmm. and he's not having en having enough, then he knows he's, he's over training. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he's yeah. he's a big name. Do you, do you do you think it was not like that then? For no, me? I don't. <laughs> I, I mean, like like as a cycling uh, cyclist at the time. <laughs> You were traveling like 200 days a year. Um, so they were not used to it to be from October till January home. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when the first training camp came in January, everybody was really happy that they finally could leave the house and uh, yeah. and start riding again and back having with fun the with the boys back yeah. with the lads. You know, like in the weekend. Especially you... when you're that age, like 21. Yeah. Did, did many... no, but I was like the youngest. Like oh. So I, I still had like a lot of fun in life, mm -hmm. uh, but they all... Uh, they all probably now divorced and uh, they didn't stay with their wives. Um, so sticky vickies in Benidorm. So <laughs> when we go on a training camp, it was always like after dinner, like have a little walk and uh, let's have a few uh, drinks uh, somewhere. And uh, drinks as in non-alcoholic booze. So like a no, a lot of on the, at the time there was no and there was, it didn't exist non-alcoholic drinks. And if you did, you would have been like that would have been totally frowned upon, wouldn't it? Yeah, like you if would, someone ordered a non-alcoholic. Yeah, beer. can I have a diet coke, please? No, 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 no it doesn't work what is like this that. Science? Yeah. <laughs> is this for something? No. So it was a pretty. Intense period, like the time that I turned pro was uh, 2004, 2005. And uh, I think cycling has changed for the for, uh, for for most of it. But at the time that I turned pro, it was just normal. You know, you, you hit uh, the bar, you go to bed late. Uh, but like when we leave at 9.30 in the morning, everybody is there and you ride your bike and for five, six hours. In in Thomas's book, he... Uh which you'll have to read, is called The Descent. He refers to it as basically being on the training camp. The aim was to be out with the lads for as long as possible, drink as much as possible. But then the next day, you also had to be on the front, pushing the pace, setting the tempo. And yeah. that was the aim, wasn't it? It was like basically play hard, train Sounds hard. Sounds a bit like a travel or mockery training camp, but then on steroids. <laughs> yeah. yeah, massively You like steroids. this, eh, Joe? You I like this? It, it sounds crazy. Like, uh, I don't but know to, how you guys but did to watch it. the after the podcast, we're going into town in Fond Rameau because there's a concert going out and there's fireworks. So it's a little at 10.30, bit... yeah? 10 so before 11.30, crazy, we're in bed. Crazy, crazy. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to say was I really liked your uh, first introduction to life in the pro cycling with Rabobank. Um, and in the book, one bit that made me laugh was uh, you, were, you were paired with Stephen de Jong. He was a man that was supposed to be a role model for you. He was supposed to look after you, nurture you, and show you the ropes. Um, a real voice of experience. Now, take me back to your first experience uh, when you met your roommate, Stephen, for the first yeah. time, because I thought this was absolutely hilarious. Like, <laughs> And I know our listeners will definitely like this. Like, Do you think this yeah. will make the podcast? This will make the podcast. Like, <laughs> Tom, are you going to yeah. cut this out? Because <laughs> sometimes, I mean, sometimes we take bits out just because the podcast gets too long yeah. or it's... Or it's too... To, some people you can, can't handle the you truth. Can, yeah, you, you, you can. Do, it's uh, it's all right. It's, so it was like my first race. Uh, I was a, a stagiaire, so it means you can uh, get a taste, like an intern, an intern. intern. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it was in two thousand four. So how old were you then as well again? Was it nineteen? I just turned yeah. twenty. Just turned twenty. Yeah. So that yeah, it was in September. The week before I turned twenty, and uh, I came to the room. I came. 
<laughs> and uh, it, it's a funny story, and it's a long time ago. It was in two thousand four, and uh, so seventeen the guy, so the years guys, ago. So the guys put put uh, put some porn on, and uh, he throws me a towel, and he said, "Let's have a wank before we going to ride our bikes." And I said, <laughs> "Okay, is this normal?" And I I uh, I uh, was sitting on the bed, and I he, g- he gives me the towel, and I thought like, "Yeah, let's do this, and let's <laughs> later on let's have a ride." Uh, maybe this is just how it goes in pro to, cycling. To quote what you said you thought if this is a test then i'm not about to fail it i want to be one of the lads yeah um that is i mean i if, if you would have done that to me on my fr- on your fr- on our first training camp joe i would have been flipping shocked mate. I would have been like, that's the race mate that's the first Fuck. race that would have been in new zealand just for the race <laughs> if that's what you're into like all right accept you as a person who you are i i, I support your journey yeah. but <laughs> i don't know if we can do this <laughs> i'm not sure if i got the minerals now, going to uh basically back a bit more to the training and yeah. to uh the racing so uh when you were first at Radbank, you decided to get coached by Cecchini, didn't you? Who yeah. was a really uh, top-notch Italian coach. Coached uh, Jan Ulrich, um, Pataki, Ivan Basso. Even Basso. So loads Pantani. of the Pantani. T- Pantani, loads of the top names. And he only did it for fun, didn't he? He had a real passion, I guess, for coaching. And he yeah. wanted to coach people that he thought could win some of the biggest races of all time. And obviously, Rabobank weren't happy about that, but you decided to stay with him anyway. Like, a lot of our, in- our listeners are interested in the training and performance and stuff. Like, how was the training with him? Yeah. And uh, how did it go initially? Like, was it a lot different than what you had been doing, like, be- uh, before you turned pro or at the start of your pro? Like, what pro career, what was it like? Absolutely. So, um, I started working with him in the winter of 2005, 2006. I had my first year finished at Rabobank. I won four professional races. And I went to Italy and I met the guy and I had to do a test on the Montessera. And it's a test around uh, between 16 and 20 minutes. And um, uh, I, I did it and he said he liked uh, the watts. And uh, uh, I bought two SRM systems. So yeah. to, to get my now on every bike there, you can, uh, you, can, you can see your power. But at the time, nobody was having that. So uh, I bought those two systems and I started working with him. And that also meant uh, that I moved to Italy. And um, I lived for the first uh, five, six months in a hotel. And the training was completely different because before I was not training with any power. I was just training, uh, looking at my heart rate. But, you know, if you only have heart rate, why? Yeah, the day, some days you're tired. If you would now train, Joe, every day with a heart rate monitor. Yeah, it just wouldn't be accurate. No, you're like in one month in Fontremeau, you would would not have the good info because you get tired, your heart get tired. And uh, with with power, you see every pedal stroke. So it really made sense. And... um, uh, so I started to do the 40 20s, uh, yeah. you know, and now most people do the 30 30s, uh, but at the time it was the 40 20. So you do 40, 40 seconds, 550 watts, 20 seconds rest, repetitions of 10. I, I, see, I really started working on my time trial uh, intervals and I lived for the first time in my life in the mountains. So that and made a huge difference. Did it? What was, when you say you're doing the time trial at intervals then, so were they like more tempo stuff, like below threshold? Or was it like threshold stuff? And so above, like- the, the time trial stuff that I did the most, you have like a really big, big flat road um, just outside of Pisa in Tuscany in Italy. And um, uh, the, the, the short time trials, I always did it on my time trial bikes. That's why I bought uh, the two systems, the two SRM systems. And for the short time trials, I always did like the six times four minutes and then uh, one minute rest in between. And it was always around threshold. So in the position of the time trial, uh, yeah, you guys are experts in that. You know how that is. And for the really long time trials, uh, I always did uh, the six times eight minutes. So that's basically an hour. Um, and yeah, you're just killing it. Uh, and like you know, threshold. Ex- yeah, threshold. And um, so for me at the time, threshold was like 420, 430 watts. Um, yeah, and um, in the book, Thomas refers that in to back in January of two thousand and five. So basically, after I think three or four months of being coached, was it with it was uh, January two thousand six? January two. Oh, sorry, January two thousand and six. That his coach got him to do a sixteen. Well, an effort to the top of the climb that was there, and you did that with Pataki. Was it and Tyler Hamilton? Yeah. So Tyler Hamilton, awesome cyclist. Uh, obviously, he had a bit of a checkered past as well, but. 
you left him for dead. And at this point, you were clean as well, weren't yeah. you? Like, let's stress that Thomas was clean then. And he managed to hold 493 watts for 16 and a half minutes up the mountain, which uh, is just 69 kilos. Every, every crowd kilos. would say over reading power. Yeah, <laughs> but that was uh, that just shows the so uh, ba basically. The I was like uh, that winter. I spent like December in Stellenbosch in uh, in in uh, South Africa, and I trained for like um, yeah. I had you, like four weeks uh, of. Um, you trained with Jan Frodeno in that time. Yeah, at the time they were also yes, there, yeah. and uh, at the time they were not famous, and there were some German uh, triathletes. Yeah, um, they yeah. probably weren't keeping up with you on the climbs. Were there were they? no were competition. Out, yeah, if you were putting out them kind of numbers, <laughs> I don't think they were going to last. No, too long. but it's always you know it's like yeah, it's a, it's a different sport because you guys do so many uh, different things, uh, and we were just focusing, and I was um, so motivated because I was a young uh, professional bike rider. I dream, uh, I was dreaming about that all my life. And uh, I, I put the work in and then somewhere in January, I, I just finished the training camp with Rabobank. He said, like, let's go to Montessera. And uh, that's like the famous climb where Ulrich, uh, Pantani, Casa Grande, all the big names did the testing. And uh, yeah, that was uh, that was the start of everything. Had Ulrich gone up there? Was Ulrich the one who had the record for the climb? Because yeah. uh, how much quicker was his? Yeah, uh, time it's, up it's there? kind of a, a, a bit quicker because it was like after the Tour de France in the season. It was the week before he got uh, out of the race. Um, uh, he had some problems with uh, with his blood values and he couldn't race uh, anymore. So he was in his peak. But I did it on the twentieth of January. And he did like 30 seconds faster. Oh, right. And obviously conditions would have been a lot faster back and then And with well. doping. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and with doping, yeah. Um, and then was it the uh, Giro in 2005 or 2006? 2005. Where 2005, which was your first taste of like, holy shit, this is going yeah. quick. Because you, your first pro races, you were actually doing well. You were, like, you'd won some, you'd been on the podiums. But then it was that Giro where you thought, hang on, something's not quite right here. The pace is just so much quicker. Because you've been smashing them all on training camps, you were yeah. saying, in the winter. And then... The big races came on in the summer and you were still doing well, but nowhere far as near as well as they were. No, absolutely. Yeah. So you, you come in an old uh, old school uh, environment of guys uh, and also uh, the people who are working in the team. Uh, they have so much experience. They're like 20, 20 30 years in the sport, uh, doctors. And uh, you know, the first year you don't realize why is this happening to me? And then you start realizing I do all the training, I'm skinny, I work my ass off, I move to Italy um, and I can't keep up when it's getting really important. Like in a three week race, you have to recover. And sometimes, you know, I lost like 40 minutes on on a, on a, like a, the Stelvio day. In the, in what, the was it the like day. the pace was like noticeable at the first, at the start? So was it like even on the first day when it started, were you like, bloody hell, like I've got to do this for three weeks? Or yeah. was it like more like 10 days in that you started to notice that so you weren't recovering? You, you never start immediately like in the really high mountains. You start with a time trial and then you easily get into a big tour. Um, so how if the mountains are higher and there are more meters of climbing you have to do every day, uh, yeah, you st you start feeling it then, and then you don't recover as well as the other guys do. And to be honest, it was a weird time in cycling because half of the peloton was doing nothing, yeah, and the other half knew uh, they knew what to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it was frustrating sometimes uh, for a lot of people and. Then you start noticing and people, you like your roommate is talking about it. Like this is what they're probably doing. So what's the first time you ever heard about it on a, for example, a training camp? Would someone say... Oh, it's funny, like the first year I bought some vitamins. Like I, you had to take them oral uh, later like on. Fish oils and stuff Like as fish well, oil and stuff like that. And it was for seven, 800 euros. I got the whole package, the multivitamin, the fish oil, the vitamin D. <laughs> you can uh, like iron, uh, everything. And uh, I was walking uh, with all this stuff to my, my room to put you know, it in my suitcase. You would have also bought, back in the days, it would have been then, like a glucose monitor, AG1, all that kind of stuff. You would get it just for yeah. like... Yeah, if that sure. was back now. I would do been, everything. You would have been on super You hated five, five yeah. glucose yeah. monitors. Yeah. Yeah. All right, go on. Yeah. <laughs> now and uh, uh, I would go, go completely all in. <laughs> yeah. all, everything on the table. <laughs> and um, <laughs> then they start laughing at me. And I said, like, are you spending so much money just for that bullshit? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, I'm really healthy. I train a lot. And this is the vitamins I'm going to use. I want to be a healthy sport uh, guy. <laughs> and, and, and they were laughing. And I was like, yeah, I'm ready. You know why, why are they laughing and uh, later on you know you get friends you hang yeah. out in the bar uh, you do you do things together you start training you start socializing and 
and slowly you get into that world. So when you made the uh, conscious, conscious decision to dope, was it more the people that were around you or was it your agent or like team directors? What, how did it? Um... <laughs> it was everyone. Everyone. I went with my manager. Yeah. Uh, like uh, I went for the first time uh, to Eufemiano Fuentes, the Spanish doctor. And uh, just to meet the guy. So yeah. the team was doing it. Was my teammates. In yeah, that was in Madrid. And uh, the first time I gave a bag of blood, uh, that was in uh, March 2006. So you, I was there with my manager. How, did you then um, say to the manager, like, hey, I had a chat with another of the teammates. They're doing this. Yeah. I want this. Or how does that work? Yeah, something like that. Because you're only 20 years well, old. It's quite so a he big was step, he it? was the he was the manager. I don't know if you remember. There was uh, uh, Ulrich got like in a fight with uh, Telecom, T-Mobile at oh, the yeah. time, and he yeah. went to the Bianchi team, Coast Bianchi. Yeah. So they were riding on Bianchi bikes, and my manager was the manager of that team. So oh, right. Ulrich was always working with Fuentes. Yeah. And uh, uh, so my manager knew Fuentes. Yeah, and um, most people are um, quite secretive about doping. Well, I imagine they are anyway. I was also at the time but, uh, a little bit, or no, but not you, so open um, as now. <laughs> yeah, I know. But like one thing that I was really surprised about was that you went with your agent to with to speak to your parents, and you kind of like had a chat with them and told them that you were going to do it, didn't you? Back Before in the time. you went like, for a chat with the parents and all that. Yeah. yeah. How did they reply? Nah, it was ter- it? it was terrible. I still see that. You know, like my manager was say, yeah, uh, said to them, you know, if you want to be successful and you want to do the same as the other people do, you really have to do something, Thomas. And my parents, they are really, like lovely people. Uh, come from a small village, and they didn't have absolutely didn't have the knowledge. I also didn't know uh, what uh, he was talking about in the beginning. And later on, you know, like they do every, like your parents, they do everything for you. And, um, and your it, mom, it was heartbreaking, of course, yeah, if you, you look back. Your mum, she uh, basically just said that she hopes that you're okay, didn't yeah. she? Like, um, so, you know, you only if you, have a, if, you, if you have a child, you just want them to be happy and mm-hmm. not that they have to worry so much. And when I started as an 11 year old kid riding my bikes, my bike. We never had thought that it could end like this. Yeah, and I remember you saying, and uh, going back to that conversation as well, that it wouldn't have mattered what they said. That you had it in your head at yeah. that point. That like, even if they said no, no, we don't want you to do this. This is terrible. You had already made the decision. Yeah, but you have like, to, to think about it. That I was when I was turned seventeen. I I was the number one in the world. Um, when I was uh, just turned nineteen, I did my first Olympics as an amateur. Uh, I won already a lot of professional races. Uh, I finished twice second on the, on the world championship when I was 19. Um, there was no choice. You know, I yeah. needed to succeed. Didn't matter how. You just want to so be at the top of the game. I, yeah. Of course, now I would do that completely different. And uh, But at the time, I was already way ahead of my own parents. So... Take us to that to, to that meeting with that doctor. Were you like super nervous? Were you like, uh, thought, wow, I'm I'm really gonna do it now? Should I like? Were you contemplating no, yourself? No, I was just uh, I just finished the bike race in Mallorca, and um, uh, it was a coincidence. I had to have a, uh, to, I had a stop at Madrid, and there were a few hours between the other flights, and I uh, I went there, and my manager was there. And the guy didn't speak any, uh, Fuentes didn't speak any English and I didn't speak any Spanish. And uh, we knew both what we were, what we were doing. And uh, I was sitting on the, on the bed and he said, lay down. He get the tube in my arm and uh, he get my first bag of, bag of blood out of it. He said, write a number on it. So I wrote number 24. That was my number. And uh, he said, uh, thank you. And, uh, and that was what- it. How, what did you, how did you feel after that? Like, what was the what was your mental state? I'm really was, into the game now. You're in, There's no like, way back. You're committed. Yeah. So, um. Yeah. Ma- massive decisions at like 20 years of age, isn't yeah. it? You know, like crazy. Because that's what you need to put yourself into, isn't it? Because we already think someone is really young if they're a 23, 24 in triathlon. But it's even four yeah. years before that yeah. that you're starting to make decisions that's, like this. That's because you were like 19, yeah. lift already. What? Just kidding. Yeah, but you know the di- the difference between you guys. You know, you have to think about it that I was in a world. That the only thing that I could do and the only thing that I wanted to do was riding my bike. You went uh, to study in Manchester. You told me earlier this week. Yeah, yeah. You went to study in Leiden. Uh, you had your life over there. 
you went into triathlon a little later you you did triathlon already before you went to study yeah. and then you got out for a few years and yeah. then you got back but at the time there was just one focus and the whole country was hoping that one day i was going to win the tour de france yes. so there was like a lot of pressure from myself but also from the outside so i was living in a really small world yeah yeah no i remember you saying that in your book that like basically you what well, even when you were at high school you'd already made the decision that yeah. you were going to be a pro cyclist and that was where you were like fully driven to weren't absolutely you? And, like, and that was when when you made that decision that you were going to be a pro cyclist that was when your results really started coming on wasn't it yeah because and i stopped high school yeah yeah you, yeah and uh, i remember one time in the book your mom and dad uh, or i think it was your mom rang you up and said your results are terrible because you'd hidden your uh, bad yeah. results, hadn't you, from them. And they said, you need to come back from the training camp. And you said, no, I'm not coming. I think, or was it training or racing? It was racing. racing, yeah. And you said, no, I'm not coming. And you came back a couple of weeks later, didn't you? Yeah. And uh, they couldn't they couldn't believe it. But yeah, then, we, don't have, we didn't have cell phones like yeah. with, uh, with credit on it. So like I had a cell phone, but if I had to call my parents, I had to go outside of the hotel, put some money in the machine and yeah. call my parents. But um, so we've gone to... Basically, from when you first met Fuentes and you've you've given given your first uh, like blood to him to like say for later for a blood transfusion. So, how did t- the rest of two thousand and six go? Like training wise, your races, and was there a big leap up in performance from two thousand and five when you were racing clean? How was the trans like you know how did it initially the difference go? Difference with using yeah, because that's what yeah. everyone's always interested in. Basically, uh, the first time I did a blood transfusion, I won immediately uh, Tireno Adriatico. And I was all tr- all winter training. Uh, so going back to that then, so he took the blood before three that weeks, in Mar- three weeks before, and then did he put it in like a three, week, you know, like four days before? Oh right, literally right before that. Yeah. Uh, so I had to fly back, get the blood in. Uh, but that winter was funny because I was training with a German guy, Jorg Jaksje, and um, we were training all winter together. And I didn't know that he was also at Fuentes. Yeah, yeah. So later on that year, uh, Fuentes got caught. In 2006. Oh, that was the year he got caught yeah. as well, was it? I, so I was there only for a few months, yeah, and yeah. then it was done. Uh, and later on, uh, I was I was with Yaxe, and I said, like, how many blood bags did you do for T right now? He said, I did two. I said, and then I told him, like, I did one. I'm much better at it than you are. <laughs> 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 so the whole scandal came out, and with Ulrich and all the other sports, um, in the end of May. And I started with working with Fuentes in March. So, so know, there are still two blood bags somewhere in Madrid, if they're still there, you know, because I gave them uh, and I never got them back. <laughs> but did you, did, you didn't get caught of any of that? Did Nobody found anybody? out because Nobody I did it with a secret phone and I paid cash. Okay. So, you so, know, um, smart. <laughs> going back to Torino then as well. So you won that massive world tour race. Were your power numbers, because obviously you said you were using an SRM, were they better than before or was it the same kind of like numbers? Yeah, what's the hitting? difference? The blood I have to made... say, like, like with all the information that I have now, and um, normally you give the blood in the winter. Yeah. And I was giving it three weeks be- before. So yeah. that's not ideal. Yeah. Because you get like a half a liter less. Yeah. And your body needs your body to recover. Can't recoup, can and it? you can train also like 100%. Yeah. Uh, because you just uh, have le- less red blood cells. And I trained so much that winter. Uh, I was alone in Italy. I lived in a hotel and there was no internet like how it is now. So uh, I worked my ass off. And I think a race like Tirreno, you can still win without. And yeah. uh, to have like the, the blood bags coming in a big tour, like the Tour of Italy, yeah. the Tour de France or the Tour of Spain, makes a huge difference. But this makes a difference and it's also it works in the head because you know that you did something what uh where your body reacts really well on you have extra red cells but it's not that i did like a higher higher power output uh, yeah so the power was like similar you think it was mainly just the confidence yeah and everything you know like now i'm I'm a real pro yeah but you know in a weak race you still can manage that if i would do it now i would do it completely different you know like like uh at the time i really thought you need to do this, but you lose also a lot of energy to do all that crazy thing. So when you say if you were to do it now, you do it completely different. Like, how would that change? Would it just be you do it in the winter? No, like- I do it like with all the information, of course, that I know now. 
I would go on altitude camps like you guys know. I would be skinny as fuck. <laughs> and uh, I well, would just use my, my, I would my engine. I struggle to get skinny as fuck though because I like food too much. Like I've got a real bad habit for like yeah, dark you, chocolate and stuff. You, like. You're a really good cyclist and you're like, you look like a bull on the bike <laughs> and you look like an animal and you you just go. But you're a little too heavy for that kind of racing. Oh, yeah. You know, you, you would be great at Paris-Roubaix. But even <laughs> Wout van Aert is a big guy. He's 78 kilos. So it's just, it's a sport for skinny, skinny, got skinny, skinny guys. You, you, can't, yeah, you would say the mozzarella is, is the right person for it. The mozzarella would be uh, great. <laughs> I'm way too heavy for it as well. Um, no, cycling is just more fun when you below 70 kilos. Yeah, yeah I can it's imagine. sad, but it is. Yeah. So going on from Torino, you've just won that first massive pro win. What was next on that season as you went forward? Did you have any races in April? Was it the Giro again? Yeah, I did. I did the races. Um, I did uh, the Amstel, Flash, Liège, like the Ardennes classics, and it was going okay. Uh, but uh, all the people. We're just doing um, EPO and they gave the blood bags in the winter. I, so, I, I noticed, like, I, I knew Fuentes really late. So I didn't have the system. So yeah. I was, like, fully focusing on the Tour de France. Yeah. But then the guy got caught and got in prison. Yeah. So how did so you So all my blood bags were still there. I gave him three oh, right, for yeah. the Tour de France. And then I couldn't go to the Tour de France because I never got my blood bags back. So, so how did the classics go that year then? When you said that, like, was were, were you in the? It's front such course? a long time ago. Like, I really I have to search they, on the internet. Oh, they right. went well, but nothing like nothing like crazy now. So, so, at what point did you thought like, all right, the ble- the re- the, the blood bags is one thing, but um, now I need to get on EPO. Yeah, now. when was that? When was that? Because it's really difficult to find someone where you can put your blood. So you would know? you so like like just... Fuentes was out. And then uh, later that season, and you see Karma is a, is a bitch, uh, I did for the first time EPO to do to go to the Tour of Poland. And I won the year before. I won the time trial in Poland with no doping. I finished third in the classification. So and what made you think to take it then if you already knew that you could win it clean, that Poland race? Uh, because I didn't want it. I, I was third the oh, year fair. before. But you must have been like in the mix and thought that you could win it clean. Yeah, yeah but that. at that time I was already, uh, I was on the train and the train left and there was no way back. And you he was on the block back train. So you and yeah. Like, like I'm on it. Oh, you, yeah, but like what you say makes absolutely sense. Yeah. Why would you like, but you know, you don't stop if you. So you just were doing it. You know, it's, you know, it was if people well cheat, and, yeah, yeah. they go with another missus or another For example, man. Swift. No, if no, but like, I mean, cheating in a relationship. Oh. Most people stop. If they get caught, mm-hmm. you know, and then they realize that it's too late. And it's the same with doping. You know, you push it as far as you can. And then the day everything goes wrong, you look back at it and you say, like, I didn't do that so smart. And that's the story of my life in cycling. And then so um, at the end of 2006, did you go to the world championships that year? Like, what no, was no, no, no. So I went. So I did for the first time EPO in August and I, I went uh, to the Tour of Poland. And the first day, a dog walks over the road and oh, I no. break my uh, arm. Oh, God. So that was, so that was so, karma. It's so, like yeah. I had so many signs. It's like, like don't do that. You go to to a doctor in Spain. Mm-hmm. He gets caught and is in prison. Then you do for the first time, you do EPO. And then uh, a dog is uh, walking over the was, street. It was, all, it was all red flags, mate. Yeah, all so, red flags. Red flags so, all over the place. Was, was, <laughs> was that the end of the 2006 season then when you broke your arm? Yeah, yeah, so, two months, two months. So, so it was September. So after that, then what was the plan with, in regards to doping for the 2007 season? Because obviously your contact Fuentes had gone. Did you manage to find another one? Yeah, I found someone in Austria. Oh right, human plasma. So how did uh, what were, what what was your preparation like in terms of like the doping, the training, and everything from the end of 2006 to the 2007 season? Because so, you- no, to be honest, I found that guy in the end of 2007. So uh, in 2007, I. Uh, started using EPO and oh, we right. went to the Tour de France with Rasmus I don't know if you remember that yeah I remember Rasmus in the chicken yeah. yeah so we went there and we had 12 days the yellow jersey so I was riding for him uh, I, I had probably I was at that time 67.5 kilos for one meter 88 Whoa. so I was skinny that is really skinny yeah. yeah and I was just pulling 100 kilometers alone in the Alps really in the Pyrenees. what literally just going but, over two mountain passes yeah, in the front alone and Let's, there were only like 15 or 20 people left. So, you know, when you said you took like um, EPO and like blood dope and like going back to them, is blood dope and like when you take the blood back into you, you like notice an instant effect that you're like massive. Yeah, the recovery. Like, and if you're just as skinny, 
But like with EPO, do you have to take it? And then would you like wait two no, it weeks? Takes, or it like... takes more than like uh, seven or ten days. So you had to kind of time that a bit yeah. more with your race. And they can like... find it, but so you the... have to stop before the race. What would that EPO do then? Also recover quicker? Or did you see no, like an increase? The EPO then... increases your red blood cells. Yeah, yeah, no, but it would also increase like your power. Would you say it only... Nah, of course, if you yeah. recover better, your power also... Uh, like you train better. better. That's, better. A, that's yeah. basically what it yeah. is. Yeah. It should transfer more um Let's fast forward to to the bit when you got caught in like... Like 2009. Yeah. So uh, this, is, this is interesting because I, uh, Rabobank had a change because they had a big scandal with Rasmus, so they have to fire him. And um, uh, I went to another team. So I went to a Lotto, a Belgium team. And now you have Lotto Jumbo in Holland, but there's also a Lotto team in Belgium. And I decided to stop with the doping. So when you what what made you decide to to stop? Because with? the the story that I just told you it was too much. It was too. Did much. you get did you get like uh, were you scared that you maybe got caught? And yeah, of course. Anxious, did you get like but, sleepless nights? Yeah, all that yeah, kind of stuff? a lot of stress. You know, you have stress. Your parents have stress. I had stress. Um, but the thing you just, is, you don't turn into a really nice person. What mm. about your mindset though? Where in the past you had been thinking. You wanted to make it to the top of the sport and you knew that other people were doping. Did you think then I'll kind of settle for not being at the top of the sport? No. Or did you think that you could get to the top of the sport I while being like, clean? Like, everybody was saying that cycling was changing. In 2008, we got the blood passport. So they were monitor, um, monitor, yeah. monitoring um, your values and everything. And uh, I went for the first time for the Tour de France that year on an altitude camp. So I was three weeks on the Monte Serra and it's like of, uh, on the on the Stelvio and that's like 2,750 yeah, meters. Yeah. And uh, that went really well because uh, after that, we, as a preparation before the Tour de France, I did the uh, Tour de Swiss. And uh, the last time trial, Cancellara won, Tony Martin was second and I finished third and it was like a 40 minute time trial. What kind of power did you put out for that then? Can no, I was at Lotto and they didn't have that's a shame together. because it would have been so interesting to yeah. know what kind of power so, you but think out. about it like you you here on altitude over here but i was three weeks this thousand meters higher yeah it's, you know, it's like crazy absolutely nuts. Nuts. if you think about that uh and and basically you're not training all uh you, you you do the downhill and you train somewhere else too but i was like 16 hours a day i was mm -hmm. at that altitude so one, one question i've got to ask you as well is um, how much does it actually cost to dope? Like, you know, when you were with Fuentes, how much did he charge you to like do the blood dope and how much does EPO it's cost? Fuentes, and, like, uh, I paid like uh, 15,000 euro cash. 50,000? No, 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 for a year. All right. Oh, so so basically I could come like, like a... three or four times. Was it limited to three or four? Or was it like you could do he as many as you He was basically, you had to pay what your salary was. So I said, I said to him that I didn't earn a lot because I was so young. Really? Yeah. And he still charged you 50,000? 15. Oh, 15, sorry. So, so, no, like yeah. Ulrich paid they, for the same things, he paid like 120,000. 120,000, yeah. fucking yeah. hell. Yeah. yeah, but if you think about it, if you're winning the tournament but, off it, yeah. like, you know. Like, what about <laughs> the uh, what about the EPO then? How how much would that cost? EPO, it's not so expensive in the pharmacy, but you have to buy it on the black market. So that makes it expensive. Why do you, you have know, to buy it? You know, cocaine is also not so uh, yeah. expensive in Colombia. How, how much would you pay for it? But they charge it? a lot in Amsterdam. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but why would you need to... Um, buy the EPO on the black market, could you not just get like a friend to buy it at like a pharmacy or something like that? Like No, because EPO you need when you have cancer or something. Oh, it's right. Like, so uh, that's why you had to get it off. Like, yeah, no names, nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So it, to be honest, you pay like seven, 800 euros for one run. And how many runs did you need? How many goals do you have? How many altitude? For example, you have? you've got a race in like six yeah, weeks or yeah. like ten. weeks. You want to be good how in many, Almira. Yeah. How many, how many runs would you do then if you do? You like, just do one for Almira, seven, 800 euros. Just one. Yeah. It's not like a... a so yeah, like seven, day. eight days in a row. Fucking hell. Yeah. Bloody hell. Um, so yeah, as we were saying, you ended up getting caught in 2009. Yeah. Uh, when I stopped doping. So, yeah. you know, I did a lot of bad things, but at the time it felt really... That like, is a real like... Like, uh, you know, you stop with this, you have a new team, you go on altitude yeah. camp. Um, yeah. But how did your... Um, life changing that because I can only imagine like I mean it was the day before the Tour de France yeah. they did it you to take us back how did it happen so there I, I was uh, so the Tour de France started on Saturday and for people who remember it it's the Tour de France that Lance Armstrong came back from his pension oh right oh that was that one was it yeah so the start was in Monaco and I was in Tuscany uh, planning uh, of uh, preparing my stuff and my luggage and everything and uh, it was on the Wednesday and the tour started on Saturday and I was supposed to leave in the afternoon 
And then around noon, I got a phone call from the UCI. And uh, it was a girl who called me and she said, um, you're positive on doping. And I said to her, that's impossible because I already knew that yeah. I was not doing anything for a year. Yeah, yeah. And she said, uh, 24th of December, 2007. So that was like one and a half year before. Was that one of the last times you would have done it? No, well, you know right? what? It, how did it go? I left some blood bags in Vienna. Yeah. And uh, the guy who was doing that, he said, oh, I still have some EPO here. Let's put it in your arm and maybe you recover a little bit better. So oh, it was not no. for racing. So it was yeah. not, not even for racing. Fucking hell. Yeah. So I was on a, a, a Transavia flight with all the Dutch people who were ski, were going to ski. Yeah. And I was with my, my, my head on my on my head and my 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 uh, my big my coat on and everything. Like nobody recognizes me. And he picked me up. I gave the blood. I flew back the day after, and he gave me some EPO. Uh, just that you wanted to be nice. <laughs> Good, yeah. <laughs> and then the day after, I got a control surprise at home. And they couldn't find that EPO. I knew at the time yeah. because it was a kind of special EPO. All so right. I was sleeping at my girlfriend and my friend called me. They are home. They, they are here for to control you. Yeah. And I said like, but I filled in. I, I sent the email that I was at, a, at my girlfriend's place. And oh yeah, they didn't see that. So I took my car to drive over there and to pee yeah. on the 24th of December and I gave the guy a bottle of wine because I thought like he came with Christmas you know yeah. I gave the doping control guy a bottle of wine <laughs> and like one and a half year it turned my life all upside down and Fucking how did um... so she gave you the call and then she was like you got called yeah you got like uh, yeah, it was like 12 30 1 o'clock and he said like you have till 4 o'clock to inform your team and your family because we are going to make a statement mm-hmm. how did your life uh, change after that because obviously that's your career and like you say like everything my career ended to... over there but what about your life after that like how did you cope with it because it must have been quite a like there must have been struggles with depression and everything yeah. after that like how how did you like what how did your life go after that how did you get over the struggles and uh how... so this was the first of july uh 2009 and then they had to do the b sample and everything i had to get a lawyer uh the first four months i spent 170 thousand euros on lawyers and uh, nobody wanted to do anything with me anymore. Can I just say, what would have made you um, spend the money on lawyers if you knew that the from the sample that it had taken that they'd found because the Because it's EPO? a really weird situation because uh, I was the first one they got back in time. Oh, so you wondered if it was actually, they were actually legal. legal, it, legally it, allowed it, to do that. It's, to be honest, it's not legal. Yeah. It's not legal what they it... did, but like, you know, everything is out. So you're yeah. already like, you Can't... know, like with the whole Me Too and the Vogue, you know, you're now... But did already, you already, uh, you already like at the time it was like the same in cycling because if your image, uh, was ruined, it wasn't, there was no way back. But did but you like have, um... my lawyer said in the beginning, this is not, this can't be true because they're not allowed to do the B, to test the B sample again like one and a half year later because it's already open yeah. and everything. So it's the same thing in law. Once they you have like a uh, a judge about something, they can't take you back to court a yeah. couple of years after yeah. for the same thing. Oh, and yeah, they I know did. that, yeah. And they um, did. But were they able to were you at, were you able to get the uh what happened with not being able to get the doping conviction overturned then? Like I mean I, Joe, just to be honest, like if I would if it, I would now know all the information, I would not get a lawyer. Yeah. I would just accept it. What happened though with um, taking them to court and trying to get it overturned? Were they, uh, you know, what? They just sentenced me because at that time I was living in Monaco officially, and they just uh, the, the they sent them, sentenced me for two years. I went there with a really expensive lawyer. What's a cast like the? No, no, just the Federation of Monaco. All oh, right, yeah, and that's the French Federation. All oh, right. So anyway, after that, you spent all the money on lawyers. Um, fighting a case and then what were you doing for uh, for a job for a career after that and uh... so i was suspended for uh, two years um so uh the first year you know because you're fooling yourself you think Let, you can really go back at the same level mm-hmm. that you were before let's first talk about the first week then you got the message yeah and you had to call your parents what yeah. about that or you had to call your best friend or whatever. so my best friend he called my parents because you couldn't do it no i couldn't do it you thought it was too emotional. And then you have to think about it, like the six o'clock and the eight o'clock uh, news started with it. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely crazy. So everybody in the country, like my grandmother couldn't go to the supermarket. It was like really sad. So what about... Basically, um, it was like, you know, it was all my fault. I know that now, yeah. but at the time, 
you just live uh, not like a realistic life. Did you carry on riding your bike for all this? Like, no. While it was going on? No. One week later, I was in Ibiza. And really? I partied for one year. With friends Like seven days a week. Did you go there by yourself or were you with friends? With friends. Yeah. and Not yeah. my real friends, but people who party every day. But you day. also yeah. did that as like a proper professional, didn't it? You yeah. would take that life as a... Uh, I got the yellow jersey on Ibiza. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I won Kona how, on how Ibiza. Long, how long did you go to Ibiza for? No, I, I, I went there for like 10 days and... Um, then I just continue to to go everywhere. Were you um were you happy with life like after the no, you know man, I was, of course not. Uh, I would do that now completely different, but you didn't find like happiness though in like other things that you were doing over that I time two thousand nine like, and you ten. You can probably find a lot of things uh, that make you a better person, but at the time I was just running away. Really, what's the um, what's the moment or the thing that changed you that you were able to settle with this and it has changed of course your life but what was the uh the thing that changed you for it that you thought i can live a normal life again and that's only a few years ago really yeah. so even when you made the comeback back in 2000 and uh, uh yeah and, and 2011 really you still weren't quite happy with, with like everything what was it how did you settle in it? hindsight i was yeah. uh, completely not happy um you know um it was just all too too hard and i was not honest to myself um so i was always pretending uh for t to say to myself i can go back to that level i need those results uh to just to be a happy person and i was just chasing the wrong things so how did the comeback um uh come around then because obviously you went to a beef you were partying up when did you decide to start training properly and how did the connection with like Waters like come a year about? before yeah. and my management uh, i changed management and uh they had like some good contacts with uh with Fortus. and Fortus was the boss of uh, of garmin yeah so i could sign a contract a two-year deal over there did you meet him before you signed it did you have to meet him in person did yeah you know, i had to go on a training camp or uh like a, it was not really a training camp it was more a camp that we all came together uh and were doing hiking and stuff like that yeah and I had to tell my story and it was really uh, depressing that uh, because at the time, you know, now you talk about it easily, but at the time I was just lost and uh, I, I could sign a two year deal and it started all well. You know, I started in the tour of Qatar, like um, uh, racing in February. I had a high level. I finished immediately like 12th after five days. So uh, I had a lot of talent, you know, yeah, yeah. so um but I made a few mistakes, you know, before I was always under 70 kilos. And at that time when I came back, it was 73, 74. I know, I know how it feels, mate. Yeah. Uh, uh, you can keep adding a bit more on. Yeah. Me, yeah. Like keep going north. Yeah. If you're older, you get, but, you get, yeah, you, you gain easily uh, more, more, more weight and you don't lose it. So I've never so. lost it. No. No, I've never what, lost it. You can see that you? also. Yeah. Puppy fat. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some puppy fat. But it's all right, mate. But what made you uh, uh, forgive yourself at some point and make you like live? Like so uh, basically life, yeah. fast forward otherwise it's going to be a exactly. uh, too long story um i met a really lovely woman and uh, i stopped my career uh in february 2015 after the world hour record and i moved to la and uh, basically i was like four and a half years outside of cycling so i didn't know any uh, anyone anymore uh, I was following it because I'm a cycling fan, um, but I was not in, uh, involved in, in a team or a television or stuff like that. And then the relationship stopped. And uh, I realized when I was 34 that I was never alone. And I started traveling and uh, I got back to Holland. Uh, I got in another relationship. And when that finished, I, uh, I really had to... Um, I work on myself and I followed a lot of therapy and I had to start living again because I realized that I probably uh, am going to be here for another 50 years. So there's much more after cycling and much more after my uh, career and uh, it's hard work. And now um, before I was partying all the time, I stopped drinking four years ago. So I'm, I'm sober and i started not working on myself won't even have the alcohol free beer will you no it doesn't even want to touch it's that. calories yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> but as well as being a having a hit with the results and uh being a hit with the ladies there's uh you've had some uh close calls with missing the buses haven't you like i remember with who the, with, with missing the buses like i remember in the vuelta when you were yeah. uh, 
gum and yeah now we go back like of course like just to, like <laughs> to fast forward guys yeah I, I i made every mistake you know a young kid who got too much money uh, was too interested in uh, in girls, uh, wanted to be a really good cyclist, made a lot of mistakes, and uh, I had fun. It nearly killed me. Uh, I wrote a beautiful book about it in 2016 mm -hmm. that also really worked for me, just to tell the whole truth. And um, do you think? Because um, one question that I got that my uh, my dad wanted to know because he's read. The whole, the whole book he finished it off like he was up until 2 a.m wasn't he on Saturday yeah. nights he he literally couldn't put it down and he wanted to know that do you think that in hindsight with what you'd wrote in the book if you'd have come out with everything that was in the book kind of like at the time when you first got um caught. found caught yeah when you first got caught would it have been easier to move on or do you not think that because no. you were too young that it wouldn't the, have, the uh, world was not ready for that you know like uh i'm happy that we can have so many discussions now about so many different subjects and it doesn't matter what it is, it is sport. But the time that I got positive for doping, the world was way more closed and narrow-minded. And uh, I think 2016, I was one of the first per people that could write a book like that. And it helped me. Um, but I don't think I could do it earlier. I was also not ready for that. Yeah. Now we're almost uh, at an hour podcast. So uh, before we finish it off, I want to quickly talk. Yeah, to we have to have like a few yeah. trial on the questions. Exactly. Now. I want to know what you no. think about how uh, well organized uh, triathlon, triathletes are compared to your experience. With now, let's put it more personal. Because he's been on a training camp with you and me, Joe. He's never been really on a training camp with triathletes before. How organized do you think triathletes are in specific, me and Joe? How, what do you think of the training of professional cyclists? What do you think of how we live? Yeah. Um, you've seen Christian and Gustav. You've had yeah. a long chat with Olaf. Um, uh, you know a lot about the professional cycling over at Jumbo Visma. Yeah. Um, uh, so give us your opinion on that. Um, of course. You know, like if you're with a guy, with a, with a group of guys and you have a team, like I think triathlon is like a sport you do alone. Yeah, yeah so an you're in sport. you're in your individual sport. You're riding for a team, but basically you do all the training alone. So that makes a huge difference. And uh, yeah, it's crazy the volume that you have to do. So like the many many hours you have to do, uh, and everybody has a different program. Everybody has a different body. Um, so basically, I think in the end, you know, uh, some people do it a little bit different. If I talk with the Norwegians, and I had a really nice. Um, chat with Olaf, the coach, uh, I think that's a different approach. Uh, but in the end, you're all you're all uh, riding your bike, you're running and swimming. I think they just do it uh, really scientifically. Yeah, yeah. And you do it more with your gut. Uh, <laughs> and Tom is not really uh, experienced, so I, he sees a lot of things from you. Um, this is for me, yeah. It, it almost looks like uh, uh, like like a holiday because you you can do whatever you want, you know. Yeah. Like you know how your body reacts. You are now at a certain age, and you know what to do. Uh, and you like now you think maybe it's hard working, but you know normal life is way harder working. I, I talked with your dad, yeah, and uh, he told me uh, what job he had before uh, they start uh, the B and B. Um, you know, like you're really blessed that you can do this. So it's hard work. It's many hours, uh, but it's a nice structure. And if it's professional, no, I'm used to, uh, that somebody is cooking for me, getting a massage every day. I don't have to pump my own tires. Uh, the Wahoo is on your bike or the Garmin. Um, and there is a whole program and triathlon is, I think a little bit more free because you. Uh, can choose your own. Do, do you do you really do you have a coach? Uh, I do it myself. But one thing that just made me think then was uh, <laughs> yes, <he has, laughs> coach Joe, not your average Joe. Yeah. <laughs> when you said about like um, everything sorted for the team and stuff, but what about the individual coaches? Because some uh, do do cycling teams all have the same coach? It, it doesn't do happen the... anymore. You oh, know, but... like I went to Italy, yeah. but they want to have everything in the team now oh, because right. of uh... because always it'd be really awkward to try and work. And also, yeah, I suppose, of like... course. So, what do you think? Um... Uh, Joe and I could improve then. What do you What do you think? Um, so on? I think if you're on a training camp, uh, you just need to be really nice to each other. You think we're a no married no couple? mockery. You know, like sometimes you look like a married couple. Um, but married couples always moan, don't they? Yeah, but um, yeah, but is that good? <laughs> I think it is. It brings a bit like a roller coaster relationship. Okay. You get, <laughs> if you're happy with it, uh, it's fine. Um, what can you do better? Yeah, like uh, you, you, like Joe is really experienced. Um, 
But uh, of course, you can always do things better. Yeah, exactly. Like anything it doesn't matter. Particular. Like you like the material. Um, anything in particular uh, with training. I have like, be on like time? Uh, would you say be on time? No, if, if, especially if you're with other people, you have to be on time. But that's that's a different thing. But like, <laughs> think about the structure. Like, if you are going to have a bike ride and you're going to run and you're going to have a swim, you do three things a day. I think it would be really good for your own head. Like, if you think about it, in the morning, nine o'clock, I'm going to be on my bike. Then I'm going to do a run uh, at, at like at twelve. Uh, I eat this and this. Uh, I go to have a little nap or I'm going to take a rest for 30 minutes and then I'm going to be at four o'clock in the pool and then before the night starts, you're done with everything. So planning, you would say, I would plan it plan way it, better. You would be yeah. like, this is the time yeah. that we're leaving and yeah. this is how everything's Don't going. You think yeah. I would be more strict. It? Don't you think he's planning it well? I think Joe is not a really good planner. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you're alone at home, but if you're with five <laughs> other guys, you need to plan better. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Tom... Um, what I already said because we were driving here for 15 hours um, uh, you're a guy that loses easily uh, focus in a certain way because you can focus on a, be on, on a lot of things but just now we're talking only about triathlon uh, if you can manage next year to have like two or three big goals like two uh, three big, big targets big, big targets where you go for and you say like eight weeks before, you're like your foundation is good because you train. But eight weeks before, now I'm going to focus on uh, that uh, Ironman, and uh, after that, I give myself a week off. I go on holiday, I, but uh, a little bit more focus. And Joe, uh, yeah, he's just an animal, and he focuses on his own way, and he's a lot of uh, experience. But also Joe, and when he plans it a little bit better, and he and now he thinks, you know, Thomas doesn't know anything about triathlon, <laughs> but. Uh, it, it works for everyone. If yeah. you have a normal job, you have a family, it always works really nice if you can say, I'm going to be at eight o'clock, I'm going to do this. I'm 12 o'clock, I'm going to do this. For four o'clock, I'm going to do this. Uh, my tires already pumped before. Yeah. My garment is loaded. I put my Where's shoes my on. Helmets? Where's my shoes? Where's, like, you know, you, like, you plan it a little the bit thing better. Is what people don't realize is that I'm always planning the routes and stuff, so it always delays me. It delays me. Yeah, so you're going to do it earlier. You're going to plan those routes earlier. <laughs> no, I would love it if someone else planned the routes. Not I, I think, like, oh, I can plan a route, mate. And, I think hey, we've hey, lost. Hey. And there are no excuses. There are no excuses. So, Joe, no excuses. No excuses. Also, not planning the route, there are no excuses. Wait, I think we lost like one and a half hours just standing outside and fucking around. Nah. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah, got yeah. a ride fast and you get back I in think time, you should like... ask Fabian. <laughs> so we, like, we, like, <laughs> this is so... Well, Joe is so old school, you know. Like, he always tries so, to make a twist. Joe, would I, Joe's would like, I have fitted in well with one of them old school cycling teams? Do you reckon? Back in the nineties. But you would, you would, you had to be on time. Yeah, I know. So well, you, I, what would have happened if I'd have turned up late? In you had to time They're gone. They're, They're gone. The car, training. the car leaves. The, the bike riders done, leave. Though? What would yeah, I have done? If train I, on your own? Would I just have to go on my own? Yeah. And would I got a bollocking afterwards or something? No, no, no. It, like, just... it really works like that. They wouldn't give you the tips on the blood bags. And, and we didn't have like Wahoo and Garmin at the time. Yeah. You just have to look on the map. So I'd be fucked, wouldn't I? Yeah, yeah, proper. But I used to go out with maps in my back pocket. Yeah, me too. Did you? Yeah. yeah. Back in the day. When I was like 18, I went yeah. to Mallorca with a... With a... So what's the thing about triathletes? What amazed you over the last two weeks? Are you thinking like... What have you learned from us or from triathletes? I think it's because I, I love sports. So I, for me, it's really interesting. And I, you know, like I, uh, maybe I'm going to swim this winter. I want to run a marathon and stuff. So it's really inspiring in a certain way. Uh, the fascinating thing is also that we meet, uh, yeah, you guys know them, but like the Norwegian guys, the guy wins an Olympic distance. It's a quarter of a whole Ironman. And then the year after he wins an Ironman, you know, like those things are really interesting. How is Even that like possible? Of like two months after uh, that huge teddy bear just <laughs> just do his own things and he, he wins. And then I, I think it's funny that everybody has a different body uh, and still can go really fast because you your body looks completely different than the Gustav body. And then uh, Christian has a different body. Now, Tom is... Um, it's the mozzarella. It's another godness body. <laughs> no, but you know, like it's fun that everybody can do it uh, and still succeed. So it, it's an inspiring sport. And um, I think, to be honest, and I, of course, I love the Tour de France. And in, in, in a way, it was always my childhood dream. 
But I would love to do, to do at a young age uh, do, you used to uh, swim. the triathlon. You used to swim, yeah. mate, like back when you were younger, didn't you? Yeah. Before we go, just uh, just uh, wow me and the listeners. What was your peak five minute and twenty minute path from when you were like riding? Best you ever saw at some point when you tested. Uh, five minutes was that. like almost six hundred watts. Uh, it's seven seventy kilos, and uh, twenty minutes was five hundred watts. It's almost as good as you, Joe. Oh God, could you imagine? Like, if only I lost. <laughs> and 10 to kilos. be honest, like you know, like now in the beginning when you write a book and you you you, you say your I truth, did. like people don't have to believe it. But this was like when it, with no doping. I did five. I did five hundred watts once for five minutes, and I was like fucking spanned yeah. afterwards. Like that was literally like max effort up a climb. Yeah. Like. So for twenty minutes is just, and that was, and you would have been like eight Thank kilos. kilos like, yeah. Have you, um, yeah. like before crazy. we go, have you got a bullshit buster? Something you've seen in the sport, something you've seen around, that you think that's complete bullshit? Here, no, or anything, in general, anything in It'll cycling, be, yeah. in triathlon nowadays, what people are doing is a bullshit buster. Like we've said, you know the. Uh, the, uh, the sleep glucose. with sapiens, the glucose monitors. That was one of our bullshit yeah. busters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for amateurs that like train, that want to be amateur. Like, like when I would be a pro, I would use it because I think food is the ma- most interesting thing ever now. Yeah, we know can... so much more now about food than oh, we God. knew in the past. I yeah. think we might have got ourselves a super sapiens let's, customer. Let's, yeah. Maybe we might <laughs> be getting that sponsorship. And let's get the a non-alcoholic beer <laughs> <Yeah>. now. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> All right, so Thomas is sleeping outside tonight. Thomas hasn't got any bullshit busters. He's just wowed with no, technology like, and stuff. You know, like, to be honest, <laughs> And uh, um, and we can joke about it, of course. You know your body really well, and you don't know it for hundred percent, but you think that you do, uh, because you know uh, you've been out so many times. But for certain people to get an idea how the sugar level works, and they have a, like a normal job, of course, you know, like does it make sense? Are they going to be a happier person? But just to get some data and some information, I think it could be interesting. <laughs> what would most you bullshit people don't bus need to, but what? most people don't need a power meter on so the what, bike. What, so you'd bullshit bus power meters? No, of course not. I love power meters. <laughs> no, but, but it's still a lot of fun. People yeah. also like to have fun, you know, know. to buy things, yeah. have the fastest speed suit, it doesn't, have uh, arrow wheels. But most people don't need it. It could be like an alcohol free beer. That could be a bullshit buster. I I, I like I don't I don't I don't drink alcohol. Would you say it's pointless? Like you might Absolutely. Have a All right, alcohol free beers, bullshit busted. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm so you're so sad yeah. about this, aren't you? I, I, yeah. <laughs> Either have a coke or have a beer. That's what Thomas would say. Yeah, like, diet coke. yeah have a diet coke. Oh yeah, or he beer. means coke like Coca Cola. Yeah, not, yeah, not, not like cocaine. a line of coke. No. No. <laughs> would be great too. <laughs> <laughs> On altitude. <laughs> um, anyway, Joe, did we had an Instagram post of the week? I've sent you over something uh, uh, today, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you probably haven't checked your DM. You always slide. I have seen it. I have seen it. It's the guy that crashes on the wet, slippery surface. Yeah. <laughs> what are you looking at me like? What do I think of it? Yeah, you don't look really enthusiastic. Uh, I, I thought it was all right. I thought it was all right, but you can't see him properly fall off, though, can you? No. Like I wanted to see like the proper like. He the wants crash. to. Yeah, he wants to oh, see right. blood. We don't really have. He a, wants to see blood. An Instagram post of the week. Anyway, so yeah, this week, um, if you want to know more about Thomas Decker and all his uh, like colorful story. The Descent, it's yeah. called. The book is in English. Then the new book comes um, out in October. The new one? Yeah. New oh, we might be featured as a cameo in that then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> like I came, all out every tri- yeah, like so I came on a travel and mockery training camp, Joe and Tom on the bat with a towel, and I was like, oh my God, not again. <laughs> <laughs> but he this thought, is like a, if this is a flashback. Test, if this is a test, I'm not about to fail it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm ready, guys. Put your goggles on. <laughs> all right. Um, um, thanks for listening, everyone. Don't forget to rate the podcast. And also, um, yeah, if you want to support the podcast, head over to our patrons. Pay, uh, patrons link is in the bio. And trying to get over to uh, Kona. Joe, is there anything else you want to say? No, just uh, thanks, Thomas, for coming on the podcast. It's been great uh, training with you. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming on and uh, sh- sharing your story with us. It's been uh, really uh, definitely. In- interesting. And um, we'll get more of these stories on uh, in in the future, wouldn't we? Of other, other we people. would do, yeah. But I think it's going to be hard to find people as honest and uh, willing to talk to us as as uh, much as Thomas. But uh, hopefully, we can get more people on. But yeah, thanks again, Thomas, for coming on the show. See you, mate.